the impact on the construction industry. This is from a logistics scheduling, budget management, and contractual obligations perspective. Even though most in the construction industry have been fortunate enough to be allowed to continue activities, we have had to adapt, modify, and innovate ways to keep everyone safe and meet project deadlines throughout these unprecedented times. Uh, Al City Gore is a uh, civil engineer graduate from UF, go Gators. I, he's been involved in the construction industry for five years as a project engineer and uh, has had the chance to work in a variety of projects uh, ranging from roadways, bridges, and airport airfields. And I'll just give it over to you, Elsa, today, if you don't mind. Awesome. Um, forgive me in advance. I'm kind of new at the Zoom thing. So if any technical issues, we'll be here, right? Um, so my name's Alcide. Um, as you mentioned, I, I graduated in 2015 from the University of Florida as a, with a civil engineering degree, BA, bachelor's. Um, after that, I've spent the last five years in the construction industry as a project engineer. As uh, my bio mentioned, I've worked in, in the concrete discipline of bridges, flat work, more specifically with airfields, airports, apron, and so on. Um, I've had the chance to kind of go over the office, which is the project manager and the office manager role, but uh, most in the last three years, I spent most of the time in the field, which gives me a little bit more experience of just hands-on. Um, in general, so I think, as we all know, after February, April, March, this um, unprecedented um, pandemic came through. And that in itself kind of affected the construction industry as a whole. Um, today I'll be speaking more in a personal level, how it's affected the construction industry as in my eyes. Um, unfortunately, I haven't done any or read any statistical or research. So I'm just here to, to kind of inform you guys of my experience. Um, furthermore, so, Around February, March, as we all know, the pandemic started um, affecting us. I was fortunate enough that my company never was in a complete halt, but we saw the impact of, that COVID has had in our projects from a small project, which is your, your small airports, to a major project, which is your military bases. I think, um, First and foremost, our primary and first um, task that we had to attack was keeping our employees, but also their families safe. Uh, we all know that as employees um, contract COVID, either bring it to the job site or contract it in the job site, they take it home. So our main job was keeping them safe, whether it was um, first following CDC guidelines, which covers your distancing, your mask wearing, travel um, restrictions, and quarantine. Um, with that said, we had to kind of squeeze, squeeze our budget. We had to squeeze the amount of people that we had at the job site to actually be able to meet those guidelines. Um, and unfortunately, in the field, construction, maintaining distancing at some point becomes pretty much impossible because you, you have a task that requires two individuals, uh, a two by four that is only four feet long. One individual holds one end, the other one holds, holds the other end. You're not meeting your six feet guidelines. But at that same time, we try to mitigate other issues that would help in the, in the, in the spreading of the COVID, which is we try to do everything outdoors. If you're, if you're building a building or if you're working inside a building, if you have to build a table, go, out the, go outside if possible, build the table and then come inside. At all time, wear a mask. Um, in addition to that, we added an enormous amount of um, hand wash stations throughout the whole entire project. And, and yes, um, construction as we all know, has a specific um, focus in safety but dealing with the pandemic was something that no one expected and no one was ready for. This is something that was unforeseen. 
Um, this in itself obviously carried a budget um, increase, but it also carried a delay increase because now you have the same amount of work to do in the same amount of time, but now you have to add all these outside, uh, outside tasks that you, we didn't encounter. Um, furthermore, uh, other issues that, that COVID-19 has affected um, the company I work for, it is logistic of materials, which is huge and it is something that has affected across the board. Um, logistic of materials, which is, includes the delay of materials, it includes the, the arrival of materials or even the, the materials that are coming from internationally into the United States. Um, that in itself creates a shortage of, of materials and that, what, what that entitles is a, a, again, a delay of, of the job site of the project, but also it, it, it encounters that projects, now you, instead of um, receiving a pneumatic drill in two, three months, now you, now you have to wait half a year to receive it. Or um, now that no one, no one really knows when an equipment is gonna break down. So, but uh, usually an equipment breaks down, you get the part in two days, you overnight it and the equipment is fixed. Now you don't know when that equipment is gonna go up again. So it creates a delay of schedule, which at the end of the day, which I will circle back to, that creates a, uh, that creates a not meeting responsibility in, in the contract. And I will circle, I will circle back to that as, uh, as we move on. So logistics of materials in the construction industry was affected heavily. Um, and even though construction in its core was not shut down completely, we were considered one of the, one, one of the primary um, industry that had to keep going. Now we were, we were stopped just, just because we didn't have material. You can't, have, you can't continue a construction project without having the material, or we're constantly, as I've mentioned before in previous topics, having people getting sick or, uh, or reducing the amount of um, employees you have at a project due to keeping the CDC guidelines. So that was a, a huge issue in, in my projects personally, um, something that me and my project manager had to sit down and really get our brains together to tackle, tackle the issue. Because at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, our main goal is to keep our employees and families safe. Now, um, going back to what I mentioned with the contracts. Um, now, the contracts is something that I personally I am not involved. I'm assisting my project manager. So I have, not, I have eyes on the issues that are are being impacted doing the legal side of it. Um, but I'm personally not sitting with the lawyers or the attorney to kind of cover that. So I'm gonna just give you a little bit of what I've experienced and what I know. Um, the contracts in itself, we, we have, in the contracts we have, um, we have clause for delays. We, we prepare for on unforeseen weather, we prepare for materials being late, but no one, no one writes a contract prepare for a pandemic. And that is something that obviously it will change from now on, but we're talking about projects that were already going on when this, this pandemic hit. So now we have legal, legal, legal issues, attorneys, lawyers, going to battle because the, pan, um, the pandemic has never, it has never been in the contract, but how do, you, how do you justify your delays? How you justify not being on time with your project? How do you justify the fact that your materials are late? And how do you justify your lack of employees if pandemic was never something that was included or implemented in contracts? And, and this is something that obviously, the, um, as we're talking about the construction is, uh, industry, is something that we're, we're trying to handle. But at the same time, this is something that insurance and other industries are trying to tackle. Um, so in, in the aspect of contracts, that is, by my personal experience, our biggest battle 
and it will go on until either we find a vaccine or it will just go on for, I, I would assume for years to come. You know, the, the battle of, of fighting a pandemic as the pandemic, the idea of, of the, the idea of actually having the pandemic is a challenge, but it is something that the, that the construction industry will overcome. Because that is that is what is marvelous about construction. The fact that we are touched about, we are touched with every issue in the nation, but we overcome every every issue that this nation come through. Either either we implement, modify, but we always adapt to that issue. And at the end of the day, this issue does not only affect construction, but it also um, it affects every every subcontractor in construction. It affects the owner. It it is, uh, affects the developer. It affects the um, the supply vendor, and to build a project, it is a human body. We all need to work together and efficiently to make that work. But I, I, I till this day still believe that this challenge that we're facing in the construction industry, which I, I really love the challenge that it gives me on a daily basis, I, I do believe that this challenge itself we're overcoming will make us better in so many aspects. But as of right now, we are, we are struggling in, um, to, to adapt to it because it happened so quickly. But um, slowly but steady, we're, we're going forward. Thank you, Alcide. Um, we can uh, take questions now. I think there's few enough of us, so uh, whoever just wants to unmute themselves, um, or maybe I would need to unmute you. Um, so if anybody just raises their hand, um, if in the chat box, or um, let's see. Yeah, it's... Uh, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Kwando. So um, at the end of the day, as far as uh, who's paying for all of these things that like all the new water washing stations and all of that, who, who ends up paying? Is it the owner? Is it the contractor? So at the end of the day, um, the, the increase of equipment, the increase of PPE that we have to provide to employees to keep them and their families safe. Mm -hmm. We as a contractor have to supply that. The, the owner, at, at, at the end of the day, the responsibility of a contractor to the employee is to keep them safe and their, and their family. And we are responsible for that. You know, it is, um, it is something, it is a cost that it was not, it was not expected, but no matter how much money or how much uh, at a monetary level it takes to keep our employees safe, that, that's the amount that has to happen. Because at the end of the day, they build our projects and we move forward with that, you know? So is this gonna end up going back to be built to the owner, even though you, the upfront cost is met by the contractor, of course? Yes, and that is something that right now is being fought in the legal fees, which is one of the topics that I touch. Because um, as I mentioned before, a pandemic is something that no one was prepared for. It was it's something that no one had implemented in their contract. So we, we all know and we all understand the situation and the unprecedented time that we live in, but we also all know that projects with contractors, owners, subcontractors, is led by contracts. So if you don't implement not that, that issue in your contract, then it's a legal battle, which is a legal battle that we're currently going on. You know, so. Okay. So as far as, are you guys, okay, so I know that you, you guys have worked with like airports and government entities and, and uh, organizations like that, which are cutting, cutting back quite significantly on the scopes of their project. How, how is that affecting you? I'm, I'm glad you touched on that topic. Um, as I was ending my, my presentation, that is a topic that I was like, oh man, I forgot to touch on that. So I'm, I'm happy that you actually brought that up because that is 
an issue that is not affecting us now, but it would affect us in the short term future because as this pandemic continues to just go through the year and extend longer than any scientist was ever pre uh, predicting, now clients and owners are getting what we consider jittery for future projects. Um, that is, uh, so as of right now, we're continue working, but the bidding process, we're bidding less because there's less clients and less, less, um, financial institutions and owners willing to start a project because they don't know where this is going. Mm. So the, the future, whether short term or long term, it is something that as an industry, we're hesitant. We don't know where it's going to go, to be honest. It is something that, um, you know, the last time that we that the industry really felt like this was with the housing crisis in 2008, 2007, that we really did not know where this was gonna go. And right now in 2020, we're sitting and hoping that we solve this issue, you know, early next year or, you know, as soon as possible. But as, as we sit right now in November, we thought this was gonna, we were gonna solve this issue in June. And this is just keeps on extending. And, uh, we all know the construction industry works in a monetary in a monetary way. So, as it keeps extending, budgets keep shrinking, and clients owners get jittery about future projects. Okay, and then one last question. So, um, does it look like there's going to be any governmental federal agencies that might be willing to subsidize some of your costs? Um, so. I've in that in that area itself that is a more of a higher manager question um, again I will give you the information that I personally know um, I, I am aware that the government right now has assisted the um, small companies and big companies in um, in keeping in, in a monetary support to keep our employees safe and to keep our company moving that has happened um, I don't know if it's going to continue to happen. Um, I don't know if we can maybe join big construction companies to have the construction industry as a whole stay moving forward. But I, I really don't know if the government is planning to, or any big organization will, is planning to continue to support the construction industry as a whole. Okay, thank you. No Thanks, Quando. Uh, Sanele has her hand up, so I'm unmuting her right now. Sanele, you can go um, ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the, uh, the presentation, Alcida. I just have a question. When you, you talked about contracts, and I, I know you didn't go into too much detail in it, but uh, like you said, the contracts make provision for delays and disruptions. and do, was was the pandemic considered an act of God? You know, when in the contract, there's always Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that in itself is um, again, this is something that we're continue going to battle. You know, with lawyers and attorney, but yeah. is it is something that we're still trying to navigate through. It is yes, it is something. It is it is an unprecedented like any hurricane, like any earth, any earthquake, like yeah. any, um, you know, it, it's unprecedented. So you, you don't plan for it, but at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, the construction industry is, is based off contract. If you don't have, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't have in your contract, um, a, a provision or a claw for a pandemic, then how are you going to fight that at a court? You know, yeah. but then it goes back to the to the question that, well, how are you going to ever even predict that there's a pandemic coming? You know, so yeah. it is something that we are continuously as of right now, as an industry going going against insurance and going against owners to kind of at least mitigate. We all understand that, you know, we're all going this together, but at least understand and mitigate the the damage that this pandemic has done not only to the project but to the contract itself 
All right. Um, just to add on to that, um, I'm in South Africa, so uh, obviously we don't have natural disasters and, and so on. Uh, do you, in the States, do you, is it in, included in the, in the contract clause, for example, the hurricanes and, and Absolutely. The tornadoes? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, um, I live in Florida. Um, so Florida, on a yearly basis, gets, um, is known to get hit by hurricanes. You know, mm -hmm. so if my project is known to start in May um, and I know it's going to last a whole year in my contract, I'm going to make sure that I have weather delays because weather, you know, now mm -hmm. I, I'm not, you know, you're predicting that the, the season of the hurricane season, because I live in Florida, I'm going to have weather delays. Now yeah. that may change between states. Because, you know, California might have um, um, blizzards, you know, you don't, you don't have blizzards in Florida, then you, you add that to your contract and depend, depending on what state and what weather you can forecast. Can I do it? Can I do it? Absolutely. And um, I just wanted to find out, when you, you talk about that it is included, the natural disasters are included within the contract. And now when we, when we look, watch the documentaries, when we read, other people research they told it's almost as if they knew that there was a pandemic that was you know coming you know the, 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 there's a there's small little epidemics that are busy happening all over the world and they all could potentially become a pandemic so shouldn't shouldn't we in construction be implementing something like that of course we wouldn't know what pandemic it would be but obviously we should be including the pandemic in our contracts Yes, and um, obviously that's going to change from now on because we're, you know, we're experiencing it. Yeah. But it is, um, at the end of the day, adding delays, adding weather mitigations to a contract is, is money. Yeah. You know, so if how, so if you're, yes, we, let's say based on research, um, we knew at some point this pandemic was going to hit the, the world. Mm. Well, you, we don't know when. So every year, every contract, an additional delay that you add to the contract or a, a provision that you add to it is a monetary cost to the owner. You know, whether you take it or not, just, just having, having an additional delay or an additional material or um, predicting that your material is going to take longer to reach the job site it is at the end of the day, it's a cost that we we have to take in consideration, and um, we don't know when the pandemic the pandemic could have not hit in 2020, but it could have hit in 2030. That's a 10 year span of additional costs mm -hmm. that no yeah. one you know that we can't just like carry on until <laughs> you know the pandemic hit. Unfortunately, true. I guess maybe um, instead of having it, um, maybe we should have something almost if should the p a pandemic hit we we can pull from a specific clause yeah, yeah. So, so we don't necessarily incorporate it in every contract but we say should it happen to avoid the situation where the contractor bears all the cost yeah. and you know that that is just unfair because it's not it's not the contractor's fault the pandemic happened absolutely um I, yeah i'm part of the contractor side so <laughs> <laughs> i'm with you <laughs> Okay, uh, just one last question. Um, uh, Gwanda also touched on it uh, with regards to the government regulations. Um, aren't you in the state, the, the majority, I mean, the biggest clients you have, it is the government, isn't it? Or is, is it's not um, that? Um, it depends. Like my biggest, my biggest client is the, the government, the state, because I build bridges and um, roadways, which yeah. is usually controlled by the county or, or the state. But... Mm -hmm. Um, if I work for the airport, you know, that could be a private owner. If I, um, if I decide to, to do a, a massive Amazon airport, that's a private owner. Um, so yes, I personally, my experience, I work a lot with the government and the county, um, mm -hmm. but not all companies, you know, are oh. their biggest client is the government. Okay. All right. So I, I just asked that just uh, to think, uh, I was just thinking in the line of, uh, they would have to control regulations, you know, they would also have to, uh, for example, in South Africa, to ensure that those small companies, um, not just 
giving them money, but to ensure that those small companies continue and are reintegrated into the construction industry during this pandemic. Right. They would have to put certain regulations within their contracts that you have to include, for right. example, 10% or 30% to local yeah so i thought maybe it would work the same way over that side, in that uh, side it's um like so in in the states like contracts for that for when i work for the fdot which is the florida department of transportation they have a they have a a topic in the contract that states that we have to have 10 percent of our subcontractors to be um a minority small company you know mm -hmm. so ways like that they 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 give to the government tends to give back to the community to actually as as they flourish with the roadways also flourish the the communities so um but yeah it's i mean covid-19 will change a lot of things and yeah we'll we'll sit and we'll um adapt as the challenges come and um as as uh, always, yeah, so like, for time, for time, it's um, if it's the exact hour. Uh, Thank you, Zanella. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Hey, yes. See me there, bro. Okay. Um. First, I would say I really love your presentation, um, because that's the current situation we're facing in the industry. So I had like two questions, but the first question has been addressed by um, Kwan and Zander, which is on the aspect of um, policies and contracts that would embrace situations like this in the future, such that it doesn't uh, become so much of a burden on just one party, but at least every party, every stakeholder that's involved will have to uh, have like a, a common share of the, um, uh, of the burden on this. So the second aspect is on the aspect of technology, permit me to actually debate it because that's where my research is all about. Now, what would you say is the position of the industry? For the fact, if you are in the industry now, at least using your company as an example, what would you say is the, um, is the position of the industry uh, in accepting or in, uh, employing the use of technology to um, mitigate the effects of um, this um, virus? Because yeah, there are, there are possible ways. So what would you say the industry is doing in this aspect? Yeah, so um, in regards to technology, the construction industry in regards to soft technology, which um, soft technology I would consider would be like um, the Zoom that we're doing now, the technology outside of the construction world. Um, it is something that the construction industry right now we started using because of the pandemic, but before it wasn't a thing, you know? Like what we're doing now, usually in the construction industry, I will be meeting with the professor and I will always say, I'll go to Gainesville and do this presentation live. Or um, using softwares or to, to either have a better understanding of, of epidemics or using software and graphs to kind of better understand the effect of different things. Um, the construction industry, we were, we were pretty much kind of what we call a hardware um, foundation. You know, we were, we were just, we, we got to meet, we got to finish the project, we got to meet contract obligations and responsibility, and we got to stick to budget. That's it. Like, so that is something new that we're currently implementing in the construction industry. Just the, the technology in regards to that, because construction industry in regards to the technology of advancing projects, we've We've advanced with GPS systems, with um, mechanisms, with equipment. We've advanced tremendously. Um, just if you look back 10 years ago, um, but when I, when, I, when, when I say soft technologies, we've not really used that in, to, our, to our advantages. And, um, but again, that is something that would change, you know, because I, I've never had so much Zoom calls in my life <laughs> until, until the pandemic. And, um, and I'm still trying to get comfortable with it because I, I grew up in the construction industry. My, you know, um, it, it's gone down from my grandfather to my father. And um, that's, what, that's why I know that in what we consider the soft technology, the, the, the technology used to kind of advance, we're we don't really use, you know, it's nothing, it, it's something that, you know, cause I, we could have done this Zoom call for year, or years ago, but we've never, we've never really get, uh, dived into it. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that. So I just have a little bit of contribution to that because I was opportunity to intern with the company during the summer. And I could tell that, yes, for the, um, on the aspect of the project managers and every other person carrying out administrative rules on a project, yeah, they had like, they had some software they could use to move to carry out that work so that they don't even have to see each other physically. But what I noticed was on the part of the, um, the would I say the job site workers, the laborers, uh, there was little or not much done for them on site. So it was like everyone was just at risk on site. Um, the best they could do was just to check the temperature and, and that was it. So I kind of feel like something better should be done because um, they might not be the major decision makers in terms of construction project, but their contribution cannot be undermined. Because if anything happens on the, uh, to any one of them on site, it's invariably will affect other workers and would also affect the project at large too. So I'm just thinking there should be something that the industry could do that would embrace both administrative staff and also the staff that carry out physical um, labor on site to mitigate the situation. Absolutely. And um, yes, and that is something that belongs in keeping, like you mentioned, keeping employees and their families safe is um, adding those type of technologies, you know, adding the technologies of, yes, you're, checking, you're checking temperature, but also add the technology of maybe um, going through a scanner or, you know, yeah. before going, or before going into the job site or adding the technology of um, test on site, you know, like I haven't, I haven't till now, my personal experience, I haven't seen test on site. Usually if, if um if I, I personally if any of my team they I, I communicate with them on a daily basis and I ask them the questions that the CDC guidelines require and I test their temperature and if any of those fail then I send them to get tested you know but sometimes that's a little bit too late yeah you know yeah, so yeah. unfortunately if you don't have the technologies on site for for testing unfortunately that's a little bit too late and if you don't catch that it will trickle down and turn to a project shutdown because if if multiple persons in a project get sick then you have to shut the project down oh, yeah. like you mentioned at the end of the day the lives the lives of our employees and their family outweigh the cost of any any monetary value in the project yeah thank you very much no problem uh, anybody else Anybody? I have, I have a question. One last question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of foreseeing things like robotics becoming um, kind of gaining momentum with this because if proximity is an issue, you know, and also we do have a skilled labor shortage in construction. Um, do you think that this is kind of prime uh, breeding ground for, for that to happen? And, and how do you see it affecting, um, you know, those people who this is their livelihood? You know what I mean? Like, because normally we say if technology um, advances, people have to adapt their skills, not so much uh, a matter of being um, uh, replaced by technology. Absolutely. But so how do you think that would play out? Right. So on, on that note, technology in regards to robotics has been something that has been advancing and on the literally on the move upward, like exponentially for a while now. The pandemic has just literally just put an exclamation mark on that note. Um, in my job site, um, we've reduced the amount of people because of GPS systems. There's machines that walk, you know, that do the job by themselves with just GPS. So you reduce the amount of people that you need at your job site. Um, now the pandemic has, like I mentioned, has put an exclamation mark on that because now we're, we're looking for ways to keep our distancing and, fit, and completing the project. At the end of the day, like, I, like I've mentioned before, if I have a, a two by four that's four feet long and I'm holding one end because I have to screw it, somebody has to hold the other end. So if in the future that person holding the other end is a robot, 
you know, or any mechanism that has enough pressure to hold that in, like if it's, if it was a human, then that is something that will re, uh, alleviate that um, shortage of distancing that the CDC guidelines suggest. So yes, I do see the, the robotic side of construction moving forward as it always been, but now in an exponential way. Um, and that will affect us at the end of the day, more specifically our laborers, you know? There's a lot of people that are gonna be, um, a lot of our employees or the amount of employees gonna be reduced, um, but it's, it's also gonna reduce the cost of, um, of the project manager, you know, the project. So it is a point that, you know, the budget and um, the production you know, adding robots is pretty much like the industrial revolution. You know, you, you, you add so much machinery, you, you change so much that at the end of the day, robots replace humans instead of advancing um, um, humanity overall. And um, that's a fight that we'll continue to try to, to mitigate as we go forward. Thank you. Anybody else? I had a question. Um, uh, with liquid damages, uh, with FDOT, if they're building a roadway and you've got a bunch of rights of way obscured or blocked, you're going to have liquid damages. Um, any clue about how FDOT deals with that or whether that's an issue at all? Um, that in itself has, in regards to, to the pandemic, is is not an issue. That's just, that's always been an issue. Liquid damage with the FDOT and with any organ or governmental organization is always a fight. That's just, <laughs> that is just something that um, I've had the chance to work with the FDOT, but I, I've, I've also worked with DOD, the Defense of uh, Department of Defense. Um, and liquid damage is something that at the end of the project, we're always fighting. So, mm -hmm. but in regards to COVID, liquid damage has the the definition of that has changed a bit or yeah. or or has or has been modified or added you know to the the definition of liquid damage but in um in your terms in regards to fdot i don't pandemic hasn't affected that it hasn't mm -hmm. maintained the same issue that has always been for years it's just yeah. a fight <laughs> yeah it seemed like it would just extend it out so that uh, people have to understand and that because it's a government entity, uh, there would be uh, control through uh, bureaucrats and politicians right. to make amends for it. It's not like what you're talking about with being a private industry uh, uh, having to deal with it. Absolutely, yeah. It is, and I always tell people um, with any issue, it is such a different ball game to work with the government and private and private entities, mm -hmm. different ball games. You know, mm -hmm. um, the the times that we've worked at private airports, um, either either any contract legal issues, it could either go an easy way or it could be a fight. But it's always a fight with the government. Like there's mm -hmm. no easy way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So um, Zanelli has her hand up again. So go ahead, Zanelli. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just I just wanted to touch on the topic that Kwando just asked about robotics. I attended a conference uh, two weeks back on the health and safety and welfare of of, of people in construction, and um, one of the authors actually said that perhaps we should consider building slower. You know. The, the the advancements that we're making in in technology and and you know the robotics as they mentioned I, with this pandemic happening didn't didn't it almost you know bring our conscience back that we've sort of neglected the human side of construction because we're also focused on advancing the 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 fourth industrial revolution and you know using all mechanizing everything or to the certain extent, didn't this bring, from your perspective, when you when you look at how you're running your side, didn't it bring your conscience back to the humans that actually are in this, on the side? Absolutely. Um, I think this pandemic has, in numerous of ways, has waken us up, has um, really shined a light on what's considered essential workers. Um, yeah. 
And that's, that is the, the meaning of essential worker has changed so much in the last six months that to this day, I'm, I'm still um, baffled to what is really and, and how, how much what we didn't value, we value now. And um, construction doesn't shy off of that. This is um, the construction industry, this pandemic, um, what we consider a normal $13 an hour labor, we really valued that person when the pandemic hit. And unfortunately, that person, he or she got sick. We understood that that person understanding, that person initiative instinct could not be replaced by a robot. You know, yeah. like that, that is the one thing because you could program a robot, but on a, on a daily basis, the con, um, construction changes. On a, not even on a daily basis, by the hour, by the minute, you're on a job site and you have to use your experience, you have to use your instinct and your gut feeling to make the right choice. Because that could either be a successful, but, and, but also that, that minute of instinct and experience can mean a failure of a beam or it could mean a a success that you know your your bridge holds up and traffic goes on normal. But it's it's literally a matter of of minutes. You know, if 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 a concrete if a concrete trucks come to your your project site and the water cement ratio is off, um, if you decide that that water uh, that truck to continue and pour on your on your column, that may cause the failure of that column. But a robot would not know that, you know, or or vice versa. That's that's the type of, of situation or moments that uh, a robot or a, uh, how we talk about a robotics technology uh, cannot replace a human. Yeah. Um, and and the pandemic has really shined a light on that. Uh, absolutely, a hundred percent. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, we still got time for a quick one if anybody wants to chime in. Okay, absent that, thank you very much, Alcide. I really appreciate it. I, I learned a lot myself. <laughs> no problem. Um, like I said, I, I was um, offered the opportunity to speak to you guys in regards to the, you know, the, just the construction industry. And I've mentioned that you know, I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I can't really provide you guys a general aspect of the construction industry because uh, to be honest, I don't, you know, I haven't done the research. I haven't seen the statistics, but what I could offer to you guys is just my personal experience, you know, out in the field. And um, I'm fortunate and it's a privilege to actually give you guys that information. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I'm going to close the meeting now. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.